Good evening. Hello. How's my sound? I've got yet another new setup tonight, so if I sound weird, let me know and I'll fix it. Welcome to Vampire Book Club. Tonight we are discussing A Vampire Christmas Carol by Sarah Gray. Subtitle Ebenezer Scrooge Vampire Slayer. Which, as, as we learned, is a very misleading title or tagline, depending on what it's supposed to be, because um, he doesn't slay any vampires, and he's not even supposed to be a vampire slayer. Uh, it, it was a very different story than that. It was, I guess, trying to capitalize on Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer. This is another one of those books that came out after Pride and Prejudice and Zombies that was trying to capitalize on that trend. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. It is Christmas in, what month is it? Christmas in September. So ha happy Christmas in September. Hope you're ready. So uh, first of all, what am I drinking tonight? I have 1911 cider donut, premium small batch hard cider, apple cider donut cider. Yes, you're right. The, the lighting is very bright, but we work with what we got. So I'm sorry you can't see my cider label. It's from Trader Joe's. And it's supposed to taste like apple cider donuts. I figured cider was kind of Christmassy, though it is also kind of fall-y, which is why they sell it now. But it's a, I'm putting it in a very like Christmas looking mug. I'm excited. Are you excited? Sorry. Yes. Fix my angle here. It's a 16 ounce can, so this is a 12 ounce mug. That is sweet. It, it tastes like a donut. Yeah, I'll take it. Recommended. Do you like my shirt? I made the shirt myself because I craft now. That's what I do during lockdown because I'm still in quarantine. I know some of you are back to work, but I work from home anyway, and we're all still in lockdown. So I made myself a shirt. This is actually the second version of the shirt I made. The first one didn't turn out too well, so I made a new one. I think this one came out better. You haven't really missed anything yet. But are you ready to talk about... Ebenezer Scrooge, not Vampire Slayer. He was more like Ebenezer Scrooge, Vampire's Stooge, Vampire's Dupe. Not even a vampire minion, just a dupe. So this is A Christmas Carol um, by Charles Dickens. And just like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters and all those up, Jane Slayer, there's a whole bunch more. They take the entire classic novel and they put the novel in this book and then add to it. So pretty much the whole Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens is in here. And that's more of a novella, almost a short story. It's very short. So you can see this is fleshed out to a whole book. So there's a lot added here to make it into a vampire story. And the vampires are what we are interested in, of course, as always. Oh, thank you, Lindsay P, for the super chat, four ninety nine. Thank you for the book club. Thank you for coming to the book club. I really appreciate it. And vampires in this book, I was not pleased, satisfied. I did not like the vampires in this book. But as a book, as one of these kinds of books, and I've read a few of them, um, of course, I read Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which I was very disappointed with when I first read it. And that book by Seth Graham Smith, I found out, I thought, oh, this is brilliant, adding zombies into a classic literature thing. This, what a great idea. Who came up with this? The Seth Graham Smith guy, he's amazing. No, it's not very well written. It's kind of terrible, but just the idea is great. So props to him. And then I found out it wasn't even his idea. He was a writer for hire. Quirk Books, someone on the executive board had the idea for Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. And they looked at their staff writers and they're like, hmm, who should we hire to write this one? You, Mr. Smith, you, you can write this book for us. And he was hired to write it. And I thought he did a pretty terrible job. But it started a trend and it was fun. It's definitely fun. I like the movie a little bit better than the book itself. 
So I did not have high expectations for this, but this author, Sarah Gray, has also written Wuthering Bites, which is Wuthering Heights, but Heathcliff is a vampire this time. And um, I haven't read Wuthering Bites. When we were suggesting books for our book club, it was a vote between Wuthering Bites, A Vampire Christmas Carol, and my favorite Fangs, which was the musical The Sound of Music, but with vampires in novel form. So that one probably would have been a little bit more unique, not as much classic literature material. But um, this was the one that won, which surprised me because I did not think a Christmas book would win in August, but it did. And... Um, I know I had high hopes for her from what I'd read. I thought maybe she does a better job. Maybe she incorporates vampires in a better way because she really seemed into it, which is what excited me about her as an author with this sort of style. She wasn't a writer for hire, just tossing zombies into a thing. So, yeah. Um, the thing about this book is that Scrooge is a mean guy, right? You're all familiar with Christmas Carol. If Even if you haven't read the original Dickens novel, you've probably seen one of the movies, the Muppets movie being the best adaptation of A Christmas Carol in that it's most faithful and it also has Muppets. And you're probably familiar at least with the idea of who Scrooge is. He's an awful, terrible, horrible guy who's just mean to everyone. Um, he's rich, but he never uses his money for himself or for anyone else. He thinks people, if they're paupers and struggling that they should just die and stopping a burden to everyone else. Um, that's, that's the way he is. Um, Uncle Scrooge from DuckTales was based on him, even though Uncle Scrooge is much nicer than the real Ebenezer Scrooge. And um, in this book, the thing is, is that the reason he is such an awful guy is because vampires made him that way. Sorry, the light's so reflective in this book cover. I have to hold it very strategically. So from the day of his birth, this vampire queen, whose name is Griselda, swoops in on his birth bed and is like, there is a prophecy about this child, Ebenezer, and I don't want him to fulfill that prophecy. The prophecy being that he will be father to a son who's the real prophecy. So uh, he's not the chosen one, but his son will be. So... I'm going to turn Scrooge into such a horrible, awful person by just messing with his life from start to finish that he will never father a son because no woman would ever want to be in bed with him. Um, and then one of her minions is there and she's like, but Miss Vampire Queen, ma'am, why don't we just kill the baby? And the Vampire Queen is like, pshaw, that's no fun. No, I'm going to do this whole elaborate plan to turn Scrooge into a horrible, awful person just so he will never father a child. And I'm just going to like haunt him his entire life and just m make him just really awful. And it'll be a fun experiment to see if I could take this innocent child and just make him terrible. It's, it's fun, let's do it. And the other lady's like, I don't know. Sounds like this plan could fail. Maybe you should just go toss the baby in the river. And the vampire queen's like, silence, fool. No, we're going to do my plan. So, you know, it's a little self-aware in how contrived and silly it is. So Scrooge is just, uh, raised horribly his father is terrible to him because the vampires put the idea in the father's mind that scrooge is the reason the mother died in childbirth so he's like you child killed my wife scrooge also has a twin sister and someone in book club told me that scrooge's childhood all the scenes from that where his father is just terrible to him are straight out of david copperfield which i did not know because i have not read david copperfield i actually have not read a lot of dickens i've only read like three Dickens. Um, and that's mainly because they were turned into musicals and I was a musical theater major and I was an Oliver and I like Edwin Drood. So, you know, but um, in the present book starts out the same. Marley was as dead as a doornail to begin with. Scrooge is terrible to Bob Cratchit. Um, but Scrooge has another assistant besides Bob Cratchit, who's an evil vampire minion who's spying for the vampires. And Scrooge's ex-girlfriend, who you learn later about from his flashbacks from the Ghost of Christmas Past, she's still around. Um, so everyone in London either is a vampire, works for the vampires, 
is a victim of the vampires or is a vampire slayer or a helper to the vampire slayers. And like everyone in London knows that London's just teeming with vampires, except Scrooge. Apparently he's like, bah humbug, vampires don't exist. So he's just clueless. But his ex-girlfriend, Belle, she works for the vampire slayers. So she runs a safe house for vampire slayers. So on Christmas Eve, just like the beginning of the book, Scrooge is walking home and he's just being grumpy and awful to everyone. He's done the scene where he's like, the pauper should die and decrease the surplus population. And he walks by Belle's house and Belle sees him and she comes running out and she's like, Scrooge, please come to Christmas breakfast tomorrow. And he's like, bah humbug. And he leaves. But Belle knows that the vampire queen and her husband, um, whose name is like Lord Barstold, he's got like one of those impossible to pronounce vampire names. Let's see if I can find it. It's like a name that you read on the page and you just never pronounce it in your head because you're just like, is this supposed to be an anagram of something? Waltrod. Waltrod. Lord Waltrod, the king of the vampires. And uh, his wife, Queen Griselda are just these stereotypical cheesy vampires that are just like, we want to take over the world and they, we want to eat little children because it's yummy. No, no, no. Remember last time you got caught and then we had so much trouble. So don't eat little children today. Just very cheesy, very shallow vampires. Um, just want a vampire. And the reason they're involved with Scrooge is because he's prophesied to be the father of the person who's going to be the greatest vampire slayer ever. So that's why they're messing with him. But they wouldn't be... Otherwise, except they like to play games with humans because it's fun. So you think it's pronounced Voltrod. Voltrod? Voltrod. Maybe. But his wife is Griselda, so that's not Germanic. I don't know. So he's walking home. He passes Belle's house. Belle's like, there's Scrooge and like shadows of vampires are looking around. So she runs out and she's like, Scrooge, come to breakfast tomorrow. And he's like, no, bah humbug, he leaves. So Belle's like, oh, this poor man, I love him still, even though he's terrible and awful and dumpy and is just the worst person in the world. I have a good Christian heart and I want to save him. I want to help him. So Belle can talk to ghosts. That's her superpower. Even though she's not a good vampire slayer, she just helps the vampires. Slayers because she can talk to ghosts. So she, she calls upon a ghost. She says, any ghost out there, I need your help. And then the ghost of Marley comes to her and he's like, you called me? She's like, well, I didn't call you. And he's like, well, you called for someone. She's like, okay, you're someone. She said, please go save Scrooge's soul. You must save him. It's Christmas Eve. And otherwise the vampires are just going to take over the world. So Marley's like, okay, I'll do it. So Marley goes to Scrooge. And he does the whole thing like, it's a ponderous chain. And if you don't change your ways, you're going to end up like me. And Scrooge is horrified. And um, Marley says that I'm going to send three spirits that are going to, you know, make you feel like shit. And then you'll want to change your ways. And then Scrooge goes to sleep. So the spirit, the ghost of Christmas past comes and leads us through the whole story about Scrooge's birth and how the vampire queen was there at his birth. But even as Scrooge is witnessing these things, he's like, nah, vampires aren't real. It's not really vampires. And this keeps going through the whole thing. He keeps seeing proof and proof and proof about vampires and being like shown that they're real. And then it takes him a long time to actually get on board, even though apparently all of London's been on board the whole time. And um, we see the scenes where he's at school and it turns out his Headmaster at his school was one of the vampire's minions. We learn that his um, wet nurse nursemaid growing up was one of the vampire minions. So all these vampire minions were making his life miserable. Finally, his sister, who grows up to become a vampire slayer, and she winds up being the mother of Fred, who's the nephew that's actually in the original Christmas Carol. And he's a vampire slayer too. And Bob Cratchit is a vampire slayer too. And they're all part of the vampire slayers unions and they go to like secret club meetings for vampire slayers. And, um, <laughs> yes, Scrooge says, there are vampires. Literally everyone we know. Where have you been this whole time? <laughs> have you seen the musical Dance of the Vampires? There's a scene where the Van Helsing 
parody character comes in and he's like, I think there's a vampire in this village. And the villagers are like, we know there's a whole pack of them. They're up there in the mountains. He's like, yes, I think you might have a vampire. And they're like, it was exactly that scene. Ooh, it's very hot in here. I might have to go turn on the air conditioning. So we see that. We see the part in Scrooge's past with Fezziwig where he was happy at Christmas once and there were no vampires involved. Um, we see the part where he dumps Belle just because he's turning into such a money-hungry jerk. And it turns out that um, King Waltrod, Waltrod uh, came in and was doing like business proposals to get Scrooge to do business with him that made him turn away his love. So he's the reason that he dumped Belle, which... As someone mentioned in book club is a scene that happens off the page. So we don't even say, see why and how he convinced Scrooge to dump Belle. We just see the scene from the original Dickens novel where he does dump her, which I remember in the musical version had a very boring song. Why did the girls always get the most boring songs in those musicals? Um, and then Scrooge is like, Oh, so I'm not really that bad. I was never really that bad. It was the vampires that made me bad. It's not my fault. And they're like, yeah, but you were also still a jerk. I feel like the author kind of wrote herself a bit into a corner with that angle. And she, um, she's like, hmm, but if I make Scrooge only bad because the vampires made him bad, then is he really getting redeemed? Is the whole point of the Christmas Carol story, does it not matter anymore? Huh, well, maybe maybe they made him bad, but it was also his choice to be bad, so it is on him, but it's not like it was it kind of you, you it's like a catch-22 with this. It's kind of why this whole book doesn't work at all. And I feel like she was like, Well, I could either write it or I couldn't. I guess I'll just write it. Um Ghost of Christmas Present comes, and the Ghost of Christmas Present shows him. All the things from Christmas Carol that we see, you know, Bob Cratchit's family, Tiny Tim, Fred's family, them all like joking about Scrooge and how awful he is, but still having so much fun and still having love and being like, we still love Scrooge anyway. Then he gets to go see what the vampires are doing on Christmas. And in Christmas present, the vampires are having a bloody banquet, feasting on humans, just being like disgusting and awful. And they have this whole underground secret society. Oh. The vampire king and queen live in Scrooge's basement, by the way, because he thought they were just tenants and they've been living in his basement the whole time, just manipulating him. Uh, you didn't see my shirt? This is what my shirt has. It's got a little bat, it's got a cobweb, it's got my font, the font I always use. It says, good evening. Well, Scrooge doesn't really believe in the ghosts at first either. He still thinks it's like, oh, it's just a bad bit of beef. I'm just dreaming. This isn't real. But the more it goes on, the more he kind of buys into it. So the vampire's pre Christmas present's pretty gross. He sees a vampire slayer's meetings. He goes to see Belle's Christmas present, and she's helping all the vampire slayers. And he sees, like, what good work she does and how selfless she is. And he's like, oh, why did I lose her? She was so great. Look how feisty she is. And then the ghost of Christmas future comes and the ghost of Christmas future is my favorite ghost. I love him. He's the best ghost of Christmas future comes and shows him all the things are like, Oh, someone's dead and no one's mourning him. Everyone's talking shit about this guy who just died. And Scrooge's like, who's the man who died? I understand that man's fate could be my fate. I should change my ways, but who is the man who died? And then twist at the end, you find out it was Scrooge the whole time when the ghost shows him his grave. But in addition to all that, we also, and Tiny Tim being dead. Oh, we find out the reason Tiny Tim is a cripple and dying is because uh, Bob Cratchit's wife has died, but he has like six children, right? So his wife's sister, their aunt, lives with him to take care of the kids. We find out that she's a vampire minion too, and she's been keeping Tiny Tim crippled because she's feeding off of his blood. There's a very gross scene where that happens. And um, so we find out that she's the one that's killed Tiny Tim. And Tiny Tim has dreams of growing up and being the right-hand man to the future prophesized vampire slayer who is to come, um, who's called the Scion of the Great Calling. So the Scion is coming. He isn't born yet. 
And um, Tiny Tim wants to be his right-hand man, but everyone's like, oh, Tiny Tim, you're going to die, and you're a cripple. You could never be a big vampire slayer helper in the future. But um, So in the, in the future, we see Tiny Tim is dead. Everyone's sad. Um, and then we see what the vampires are up to in the future. And the vampires in the future are having a huge party. They're just celebrating because Scrooge is dead. And they're all like... Yes, Scrooge died without ever fathering a son. Now the scion of the great Cully will never come and vampires will take over the world. And um, the king and queen are having this party, this feast, and he sees these girls just get slaughtered and he sees his um, one of his clerks, whose name is Disgut, like disgust, but spelled slightly differently. Yeah, it's true. The three ghosts got their message across a lot better than the all-powerful vampire queen did. I should think of selling shirts with my design. I could if I did like a T-Fury kind of thing where I just had them mass produced. Now that I've designed it, I wouldn't have to make them all myself. Yeah, Lucius Disgut. Um... And Scrooge is just horrified to see these girls slaughtered. <laughs> That's very true, Alyssa Goss. Um, Scrooge decides uh, that he wants to change his ways. He wants to become a better person. He asks the ghosts of Christmas yet to come. Will this really be yet to come, or may I change it in the ghost lot? Um, so he decides he's going to try to change it anyway. He wakes up in the morning. He throws up in his window, and he's like, You there, boy, what day is it? Well, it's Christmas Day, sir. Same story. He goes, he buys the biggest turkey in the window and sends it to Bob Cratch's house. He goes to his cousin or his nephew Fred's house, and he parties with them. He goes to Belle, and he's like, Belle... You sent ghosts, you saved me. I'm to be the father of the scion of the great culling. I believe it all now. Let's get married and be happy. And she's like, yes. Just completely on board. She never lost faith. She always believed in him. She waited for him for like 40 years or however old she is, but apparently not old, too old to have children. They're talking the whole time. It's like, oh, but it's too bad. She's too old to have children. And then people keep being like, maybe not. Like, has she gone through menopause yet? And when Scrooge sees her at the beginning, he describes her as old with like gray at her temples. And when he sees her again at the end, he's like, I thought she had gray at her temples, but really she's looking young and hot. And the more he looks at her, he's like, the more young and hot she looks, which kind of bugged me because I was like, why can't old women be seen as hot? Why does she have to look young to be seen as hot? But they go to Fred's house, they party, they have a good time. Fred's a vampire slayer, so he hooks up with Fred. They go to the vampire slayer's union meeting. They uh, make a plan to capture his assistant, Disgut. Um, Bob Cratchit's sister-in-law, aunt to his children, has fl fled. The vampires in his basement have fled. When everybody woke up on Christmas morning and heard that Scrooge had a change of art and he g goes around passing out money to everyone, they all flee town because all the vampires are like, oh shit, things are about to get bad. This book takes place in the same time period as the original Christmas Carol, which is Dickensian times. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a year for you. I want to say like 1830s. I I'm just guessing. I have an entire collection of Charles Dickens uh, in the house where I was filming at last time. And I could have looked, but I didn't. And I don't have any Dickens here, but I'm sure someone knows what year this is set. Um, I know there's a queen on the throne because they do say queen. So maybe it's Victoria because, you know, she was, she had a very long reign. So um, vampire slayer meeting, they make a plan. They're going to get Disget. They do. And then, all the vampires start to flee because they find out Scrooge had a change of heart and they realize that their glory days are over. The scion of the great calling is going to come. He is going to fulfill the prophecy. I don't know why they have to flee now. Um, yeah. Because it's not like he knows what he's doing. He's like, I want to slay some vampires too. And they're like, ha ha ha, you're going to need extensive training before you do that. And he's like, okay, give me the extensive training. I'm on it. Yeah, you know, why not rush and kill him? Why not throw the baby in the river? Maybe these vampires just don't think very logically because it's only the humans that are saying these things. 
Sorry, is my chair being really squeaky? Can you hear that? Charles Dickens, 1812 to 1870. So he was writing stories all his life. He's got to be at least 1830 to 60, like right, right smack middle 1800s. Okay, I'm going to try to move less so my chair will stop being squeaky. Um, they hatch the plan. Um, Bob Cratchit comes into work and Scrooge is like, you're late. And Cratchit's like, so, I'm so sorry, sir, but my uh, housekeeper ran away and I have six children. And I didn't know what to do. And Scrooge is like, you're getting a raise and sends Bob Cratchit on his merry way. And then Disgut comes into work and he's like, I'm suspicious something's going on. And he's about to escape before all the vampire slayers come in to get him. So Scrooge grabs a fire poker and stabs it through his chest. So he does slay a vampire minion, even though he doesn't slay a vampire like the cover title promised me. He slays a vampire minion, which is really him just like killing a guy. And um, then Fred and the other vampire hunters come running in and they're like, oh, are you okay? We heard that the, we went to your house to try to get the vampires in the basement, but they all fled town through their secret tunnels and um, they can't get any of them. And then we find out later that the vampire king was killed in his coffin. He's dead. So I don't know if that's a writing inconsistency. Like they were supposed to kill him, but the queen gets away. Anyway, um, so Scrooge vows to become a vampire slayer and he's donating money to the vampire slayers. He's funding them. And uh, he and Belle get married and they immediately have a baby and this baby is a scion of the great culling. He grows up, teams up with Tiny Tim who without being drained by the housekeeper lady becomes strong and not a cripple anymore because that's how disability works. And he becomes a right hand man to the great scion. And they slay all the vampires across the world except the queen, she got away. And she has a few minions, they got away. So make sure that you are a good person and celebrate Christmas because the vampires are looking, lurking right around the corner and they could come back if you don't keep your Christmas spirit. So the message of the book still matters because otherwise it sure wouldn't have mattered if they actually completely won. Oh, 1843, there we go. I was close because I knew it was that like high collar, big whisker era of the Victorian era, which is not the 1880s, which is my favorite part of it. So the earlier. And that's the story. Um, it's narrated by a third person omniscient narrator, just like Dickens usually is. And there's times where you can tell the Sarah Gray's narration is really trying to like do the Dickens thing with all like tongue in cheek jokes where just tossing on this really dry humor in there. And sometimes it works. And you're like, oh yeah, I could totally see Dickens writing that. And there's other times where it's just like, it sounds way too modern and it doesn't mesh. Some of it's still funny anyway, because it is very self-aware. Um, there's one passage where it's talking about how vampires are secretly involved in every branch of like industry and like running the stock market and the butcher shops and the tailors and stuff and vampires are behind it all. And, and the narrator's like, who, what about politics? Maybe in our real world, because this is just a story, vampires are like politics, but now real politicians are worse. And it's just kind of like, huh, yeah. That's a strangely relevant in 2020 that the government is the real vampire. When was when did this come out? This was 2011, so it's almost 10 years old now. But um, government being the real vampire is a theme that you see in a lot of vampire media. But it, it was funny in this, even though there wasn't much political stuff in here. Mostly business financial stuff. The world is the vampire set to drain. Very true. So I would have liked this book a lot better if the vampire character is Griselda, Voltrod, um, even their minions, have been more fleshed out three-dimensional characters with goals and motivations other than blood. Because that's all the minions care about. The... Um, Scrooge's housekeeper is also a vampire minion and she's got a disabled son. And she says that the reason she had to become a vampire minion is because they would have taken her son and killed him if she didn't. So 
that was, I liked her better. She kind of fit in better and she was redeemable. Scrooge is like, should I fire her or should I try to redeem her? Is it too late? She was working with the bloodsuckers. We should just kill her. But no, she could be redeemed too, like me. That was a nice bit. Um, but Dizga just was like tearing humans apart because he was too far gone. So of course he had to die. Right? And Bob Cratchit's sister-in-law, she escaped. I'm reading the chat, looking at questions. The vampires do hate Christmas. So the vampires are very much like, bleh, I'm evil. Christmas is full of cheer. And that makes me feel sick because Christmas is happy and I'm a vampire and I like dark, evil, bloody things. And the queen is just like, Ugh, Christmas the whole time. But she sees these little kids Christmas caroling. She's like, oh, I want to eat them. And her husband's like, now, now we talked about this. She was just so shallow. Like the husband had a little more dimension because he had to put up with this bitch. But I, I just wished she was a better villain because I couldn't take her seriously. I didn't care about her. I knew she was just going to die. Like I didn't even know what her motivation was other than to stop the scion from being born. But why? Like just so she could keep living her life. She just wanted to live her regular vampire life. She didn't have any like greater goals. I keep joking about them wanting to take over the world, but... It wasn't even that. It was just like, I'm evil because that's what vampires are. I'm not familiar with G Gabriel Grubb and the goblins. Try saying that three times fast. I guess it's true that vampires would hate Christmas if they hate like Christian stuff like crosses and holy water and all of that. Christmas being very Christian, though that didn't really come up. There wasn't a lot of religious stuff. For a book that's really about Christmas, the only stuff that really mentioned anything Christian or about like baby Jesus being born and that kind of stuff was all the original Dickens. It seemed um, the Sarah Grain narration part kind of wanted to steer away from that, which maybe for the best. <laughs> well, the vampires celebrate the solstice in this book, but you know, the winter solstice. That's their big celebration. So they aren't celebrating Christmas and Christmas present. They're celebrating winter solstice, but on Christmas day, which is like four days late for a winter solstice, but they're doing it on Christmas day, like specifically to be ironic. So as vampires do. <sighs> I'm reading the back of book summary and it ends with Scrooge has only one night to save himself and all that he once treasured. But if he can vanquish the vampires, he might finally earn back the love he cast away. Which means Belle. One thing I did like about this book is it brought Belle back. Instead of Scrooge just losing his one girlfriend one time and being alone for the rest of his life, she was much more important. And she comes back and part of his happy ending is love you know they turned it into a romance which i always like i love some romance so that it does end with a love story even though it was for the sake of you know producing offspring because you know apparently she's younger than she looks or she looks younger than she is so she, she could still have babies and that's what women are good for no she she was a good character she ran the boarding house for wayward vampire slayers who needed to get back on their feet that was nice and the ghosts we're good. I like the way the ghosts were embellished. Would I recommend this? If you're a Dickens fan, yes, because it's fun. But just generally, it was it wasn't a very engrossing read. It was hard to get into. I found myself, I kept putting it down. I kept like checking my phone while I was trying to read. It didn't really pull me in. Um, I want to hope that Wuthering Bites by the same author is better because Wuthering Heights is my like top five favorite books of all time. And I really want to read it, even though Heathcliff is the vampire in the book and it should be Kathy, it should be Kathy. But um, if you're a Dickens fan, I would recommend it. Otherwise I probably would say, you know, I have already told you everything interesting there is to know about this. 
Are there any other vampire Christmas books? Yes, there sure are. I have a couple. Uh, most of them are romance novels. Most of them are paranormal romance vampire boyfriend novels that are Christmassy. I think I have one. Let me see if I can find one. I will be right back. Yeah, Wuthering Heights is, well, this is gothic too. You're saying Wuthering Heights is more gothic and fitting for vampires. This is gothic. This is Charles Dickens' gothic novel. You know, as much as everything in that era was gothic. But this has the ghost of Christmas yet to come. That's gothic. Um, I have some copies of Christmas Carol, and they are on my gothic bookshelf just because they have that character in it. So I still, I still think it counts, even though, like, the message is very cheerful. It's not tragic. That's probably the difference. Well, all my vampire books are upstairs. I didn't have any down here. Um, but I will find those Christmas vampire books and let you know. And maybe we can pick one to read for our next, our December book club. That might be a good idea. One of the reasons why um, I was surprised this one won was because I thought people would want to save it for December in our vote. But no, everyone wanted to read it now. Are you happy? So, so far for this book club, we've read six books now, I think. We've been doing this for six months. And I've only really, I haven't loved any of them yet. Like none of them have blown me away. I liked two. Two were okay and then two were terrible. This, I guess this one counts as okay now. Is this the seventh? This book was given to me by my mother who might be here watching this if you are. Hi mom. Um, she got it used and she's a huge Dickens fan. Like everything I know about Dickens, I know him from my mother. Um, she's not that big of a vampire fan other than liking me and therefore by association, but she really liked it. So she really recommended it. So I was very curious about it. That someone who is like super into Dickens enjoyed it, which is why if you are, I think you will too. This is where you can ask me specific questions about this book. There's anything else we want to talk about this book. Now's your chance. And then I will tell you what we're reading next. Are the ghosts and the vampires different groups? What do you mean by groups? The ghosts are ghosts. The vampires are vampires. Like ghosts are just straight up haunted mansion ghosts. Uh, they are not connected to the vampires anyway. Vampires don't die because they're undead, so they don't turn into ghosts, I think. If that's what you mean by groups, then yes, different groups. Um, Belle, who can see ghosts, that gives her protection from vampires on some level. It's not explained, but she's like, because I have the power to see ghosts, I'm more protected against vampires, so I'll keep you protected, Scrooge, because they'll definitely target you now because you're funding all the vampire slayers with your millions, so uh, there's target on your back. Did the vampires know about the ghosts? Um, it didn't really come up. Yes, ghost stories are very much a Christmas Yuletide thing. Ghost stories and Christmas have always gone together. This isn't the only Christmas ghost story. It's just the one that's been made into the most movies. See, the thing about Pride and Prejudice and Zombies was that it was completely ironic. Like, zombies are the exact opposite of Pride and Prejudice, right? They don't fit in there at all, which is why it's hilarious. Um, and also, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies has, like, really strong characters. So they can also be strong zombie slayers. And that's fun. You know, you can apply that strength to something like zombie slaying. But this was already in a gothic direction. So adding the vampires wasn't ironic in that same sense. So it didn't have that same sense of humor, though it did have its own sense of humor. It was just, it was different. 
Who's my favorite character in this book? The ghost of Christmas yet to come. That's my favorite character in this book. Yes, Muppet's Christmas Carol, absolutely the superior adaptation of A Christmas Carol. There's a lot of dead mothers in these books other than Belle. What's up with that? Well, women died often in childbirth and it's also a very gothic trope, story trope, the dead mother because that ghost of that loss of nurturing is what haunts you metaphorically, even if there's no real ghost. It's kind of like, why are there so many dead mothers in Disney stories? It's to make the, the children of them want something more. And it's tragic. And then if the mothers are dead, then the fathers can be like sad and them having feeling makes them sympathetic because you know, there's no other way to make a man sympathetic because men aren't usually allowed to have feelings unless their wives been fridged. What classic lit book would I adapt if I was going to write a book in this subgenre? Phantom of the Opera. Because that's what I do. If it couldn't be Phantom of the Opera... I want something with a lot of characters. Because, like, Wuthering Heights isn't my other favorite book, but it doesn't have that many characters. Or at least not ones that I'm into. <laughs> yes, Music Cabaret, I stream. I stream once a month for the Vampire Book Club. Welcome. I used to also stream Let's Plays once a month. See, making Eric the vampire, I mean, there is um, vampires at the opera as a phantom of the opera and dracula like combo so eric's not the vampire but making eric the vampire is the same as like making heathcliff the vampire it's too like cliche it would have to be something else what if raul was the vampire because the rich are preying on the we could see i am a huge fan of wuthering heights do you want to see my wuthering heights comic books okay this is my oh my light's in the way i'm going to show you sorry my chair is so squeaky Leave my candelabra. This is my gothic bookshelf. Can you see this bookshelf? So these are where I have collections of all my gothic books, Dracula, Frankenstein, Phantom of the Opera, Wuthering Heights, Jane Eyre, Jekyll and Hyde. This lighting is kind of terrible. So anyway, I have like 18 copies of Wuthering Heights over here, more so than any other version. Here's my comic books. Did I put those upstairs too? Sorry to be a tease, but it is a glorious bookshelf. And I got a bunch of my Phantom of the Opera music boxes on it right now. Those need to go upstairs in my Phantom bookshelf because the only Phantom things that should be on there are the ones that fit in the collections. There is a Muppet Phantom of the Opera book. Yes, you're right. I have that in my phantom library. <laughs> yes, of course a man can be emotional and manly at the same time. Absolutely, we know this in the real world and yet movies and books somehow don't seem to know this and we never get it in media. And when we do, it's just such a rare special treat. Because, you know, Hollywood. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of music boxes over there. Well, I make an episode discussing the topic of retelling classic stories with a vampiric twist. Other than this one that we're making as we speak. I guess once I read some of the others, I haven't read Weathering Bites or My Favorite Fangs yet. And those are the only other two I have um, besides... Uh, um, vampires at the Opera, which I also haven't read yet because I only got it recently. <laughs> if I ever attempted to get into the rewriting classics genre, well, I did rewrite Phantom of the Opera. I wrote a novel that was a modernized version of, version of Phantom of the Opera about a YouTuber. Um, so like the Christine character is a YouTuber and it was very much relevant to my interests. And I wrote this novel and I pitched it to agents and I was querying it and I queried it for about a year. Didn't get any bites. It probably needs to be 
rewritten and revised and fixed, but I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what's wrong with it and why people didn't like it. So it's in my trunk. That's my trunk novel. I wrote this like two years ago. And now I'm working on my other novels anyway, so. My favorite Wuthering Heights film adaptation. I mean, the, the thing about Wuthering Heights films is that they're all pretty good. Unlike Fam of the Opera films, which are all pretty terrible. The Wuthering Heights ones all like have good stuff. I like the Ray Fiennes one just because it has Ray Fiennes in it. But I don't think I have a particular favorite. I just like them all for different different reasons, different bits. Yes, that was the one where there's a lot of dialogue via Twitter and Twitter kept changing and YouTube messages went away. So I'm like, this book is perpetually set in 2017 and it cannot be set in modern times. Also, it does not incorporate COVID at all. So it's extremely dated already and I haven't even published it yet. Phantom fan fiction is how the Shea Apocalypse crew met, isn't it? Yes, we were all writing fanfic on fanfic net in the Phantom of the Opera tag. And that's where I met Lindsay and Angie and Nella. And we've been friends ever since. I was 18 years old. I don't think the Muppets would ever do Wuthering Heights because the thing about Wuthering Heights is that it romanticizes an abusive relationship. And the Muppets wouldn't go along with that. Like with Phantom of the Opera, the Muppets, um, they had Kermit be Raoul, right? So he's this romantic lead. But there is no character like that that Kermit could be in Wuthering Heights. He wouldn't be um, Linton because he's seen as like really pathetic and awful. So there's no one for Kermit to be. Yes, Kermit and Piggy is an abusive relationship, but Kermit is not the abusive one. They would not make Kermit be Heathcliff ever. <laughs> I didn't know there were Vampire Hunter D video games. Old PlayStation. I've never had a PlayStation. I was always a Nintendo person. What is it that sets Wuthering Heights apart as a great gothic? the complexity of the character motivations, how twisted and messed up and realistically awful they are while still being sympathetic and tragic. I know there's lots of people who are like, Heathcliff's an asshole, I hate him, he's terrible, he like abused a dog, jerk. But you can read so much sympathy into him, just not just because his life sucked, but just the way he talks, the way he acts, the way he reacts to people. and. Catherine as well like she people are like oh she's a whiny baby she's awful I hate her but if you actually read it and like read everything she says it's just so complex and so deep it's so tragic and um you know it's debatable whether the ghost in Wuthering Heights is real it's like is it a supernatural book or not or is the ghost just a dream but even without a real ghost the metaphorical ghost of it is just so dark and terrible and if I can ever write characters that complex and deep and amazing I will feel great as a writer like that's just something to aspire to and a lot of gothic novels are pulpy you know they're a bit more shallow they may have great themes and great ideas but the characters don't have that level of just like oh what am I drinking I am drinking apple cider donut cider so it's like cider squared it's from Trader Joe's it's hard cider that tastes like apple cider donuts it's very sweet, so if you don't like sweet drinks, you might not like it, but I think it's delicious. Your English professor said in literature, your character can murder someone and come back, but they can't kick a puppy and be forgiven. True. There is a, um, a trope called save the cat. Whereas if you're writing as a commercial author and you want to introduce a character and have them be likable, 
you have them save a cat. You have them like rescue a helpless animal or something. It's like you have this character. And if you're a commercial writer nowadays, you're probably starting like in media res. There's action scene going on. And the reader's like, I don't know who these people are. I don't care about them. I don't care if they survive this like fight scene I just walked into the middle of. But you have one of them save a cat. And suddenly the reader is connected. So it's, of course, you're not going to have all your characters save cats. But you do something similar in that opening scene moment to make someone love your character. And if you wanna make them hate them, you kill a dog or a cat. But um, I actually had a character in The Company of Death, which is that book I wrote. This book. Um, I had a vampire character. I had him eat a cat and some kittens. And I was you know, working with my publisher and they're like, I don't know. People are supposed to kind of like this guy. Sure, you want to do that? And I was like, yeah, but he's also supposed to be bad. Like, he's a bad guy, but you like him. They're like, yeah, but he killed the cat. I'm like, oh, fine. So I changed it to a raccoon in the book. He kills a raccoon instead of a cat because you can't kill the cat and have someone like your character. Mermaids and the Vampires Who Love Them. I have not heard of that book. Hey, if it's vampires in love, I love it when monsters are in love. I just do. See, that's the thing about this. Queen Griselda and King, what's his name, were ostensibly in love with each other. But even though they were like touchy-feely and huggy and lovey, that sense of love didn't come through. They didn't have love for anything. And it's like their love for each other didn't matter or drive anything. <laughs> when love, either love of a person or love of like an idea or a passion of some kind is a motivating factor for a blood sucking, murdering monster like a vampire, that is my absolute favorite thing. And when vampire stories don't have the vampires care about something in that way, I am not as connected. So there's actually a lot of vampire fiction that is not for me personally as a vampire connoisseur, which a lot of other vampire fans love. Like that's why they love the vampires because they're remorseless, they're senseless. They don't have feelings, but yeah, there's a vampire for everyone. That's what's great about them. There's one for me and one for you. Leif is your favorite character in my book. Thank you. Everyone loves Leif. Don't worry, there's lots more Leif in the future books. Yes, their actions told love, not showed it. And so love didn't do anything. It's not like Queen Griselda's love of her husband made her make a choice that mattered. So she didn't kill the caroling children on the street and like blow her cover. It's like, okay, glad you're not that stupid. How are you the vampire queen if you are that stupid? Muppets doing an adaptation of Dracula. See, there's not enough female Muppets for them to do an adaptation of Dracula. I don't know who would be, if, if Piggy's going to be Mina, I guess Janice or someone would have to be Lucy. I haven't done a video covering being human. I started watching the British version, but didn't get very far. And I have to go back and keep watching it and the American version. Have I read any books I really enjoyed lately? Well, besides this book and our last book club read, I have read two books, um, which are two Anne Rice books, which are in the Vampire Chronicles series, which I have never read because if you're going to read the Anne Rice Vampire Chronicles, there are 15 books for you to read, starting with Interview with the Vampire. But two, three, three of them do not matter. And you can completely skip them and miss absolutely nothing and go on to like further books. So I had actually skipped two of them. I'd never read two of these books. One of them is Blackwood Farm. One of them is Blood Canicle. And um, I finally read them this month. And I actually enjoyed them. Like they're kind of terrible, but completely enjoyably terrible. 
and I want to talk more about them. I'm actually thinking of doing a video on Anne Rice books and like ranking my favorite Anne Rice books in order of the Vampire Chronicles of all 15, um, which might be my video this month if I can actually manage to write a script. Yeah, why did the vampires need a prophecy to be mean to Scrooge? Why couldn't she just be like, I want to do an experiment on a human baby and see if I could turn a normal human baby into the worst person ever. For no reason. Why did he have to be prophesized? That's a good point. <laughs> the plot of the book hinges on Scrooge getting to Bone Town. Pretty much. With Belle, like the second he sees Belle, he's like, I'm redeemed. She's like, let's get hitched. Can you still get pregnant? Maybe. Let's find out. I like it when vampires care about a mortal, Adrian Rook. Um, but I also like it when they care about another immortal. Because, you know, all of Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles, it's not mortals they're into, it's each other. But I do like the death in the maiden trope when there's, like, a monstrous person and a normal human person together. I like that combination, too. Will there be any more vampire read-throughs? I'd like there to be, but I'm worried that people might be getting tired of them, so I thought I'd take a little break. I don't have anything particular in mind to read next. With Carmilla, everyone was begging for me to read Carmilla, so that was an easy choice, even though it was a huge project. It was like 10 hours of filming to get those six videos out. That was, that was a lot of work. Um, but there hasn't been any particular other vampire story that people have been clamoring for, nor anything that I'm particularly passionate about. So I'm going to have to do some homework and figure out what I want to read next. Hopefully something shorter. I do remember when I ran from the shoes. Those were good shoes too. The book is very ambiguous about Scrooge and Belle's ages. Um, it doesn't say their age down, like you assume they're the same age, but anytime you see Scrooge portrayed on screen, he's usually like, what, 60, 70? He is old. But I don't think the book, the original Dickens novel, actually specifies his age, just that he's, you know, a grown up. So they say that he's got, he's starting to lose his hair. He's going bald. He's got gray in his hair. She has gray at her temples at first, but then later, her hair is dark, so maybe she doesn't have gray at her temples. So I was guessing they were in their, like, 40s or 50s, maybe? Like, maybe they were 50. She could have a baby at 50. It's possible. I mean, for them to be like, oh, she's past her prime. She can't have babies. She could have been 30, and they could have been saying that. Like, when I had my last baby, everyone was like, you're too old to be having babies. I got put down as, like, a mature pregnancy at my age. So they're like, oh, it's dangerous for you to have a baby at your age. You shouldn't. Because, you know, women have expiration dates that are much earlier than you would think they are. Well, I do any more vampire musical reviews. The problem with reviewing vampire musicals is that there's no footage of them. And when I talk about media like that, I like to show on the screen what I'm talking about. I suppose I could just do like a vlog style about vampire musicals. But um, it'd be better if I had a video to show. I watched Lestat the Musical's bootleg that's on YouTube recently, which... It's a little bit different from when I saw it live, but it was nice to see it again because it had been a while since I saw it live. Yeah, people can have gray hair at any age, so you don't know how old Scrooge and Belle are in this book. You just know that they're old enough that people think Belle can't have babies, but then they're wrong. So upper 40s, maybe upper 40s, maybe 50s if we're, you know, when does menopause hit? Hope you and your family are doing well. Also hope you're all okay. We are all okay. Thank you very much. We're doing great. We are all sheltering at home still. Yeah, women in their 40s have babies all the time. Um, it's considered high risk, but everybody is different. 
Every body is different. A person can be much older and have a perfectly healthy baby, whereas someone else cannot, you know, it's different for everyone. Was the less stat the musical just as good slash bad as I remembered? Well, see, when I went to go see Lestat the musical on Broadway, Lindsay Ellis took me and insisted we do it drunk and we drunk watch this musical and I regretted it because I wanted to like retain it. And she'd seen it like 18 times already. It was my first time and my last time because it closed so fast. So I was glad to see it sober. I mean, I, I had a drink, but watching the bootleg, I was like, oh, I may have missed that last time. So it was, it was good slash bad in different ways. It's just thing about that musical is like it tried so hard and it meant so well but it just failed I'm not 40 I'm almost 40 I am 37 years old that is how old I am Yeah, I was picturing them as like 72, but apparently they're not. I mean, Lestat be dramatic sometimes without reason often. That's just what he do. Now, Lestat the Musical is not bad in the same way that Queen of the Damned the movie is bad. Queen of the Damned the movie is bad is because they modernized it. And it just does not work in modern times. And it just makes it cringy and laughable. Whereas Lestat the Musical is bad because the people writing the lyrics and the music and even the script, you could tell, were not fans. Like, they were doing it because they were hired to do it or because they thought they could make money off of it. There was no, like, passion there. And it just... It was very canned. It was very trite. It was very like, what do vampires do? Not, what do these particular vampires do? Like, is this really how Armand would talk? No, no, it's not. How come every time we have one of these book club streams about a completely separate book, we always wind up talking about Lestat? I don't know. I think my life just revolves around him. It does. Any other thoughts, feelings, questions, opinions about this book? Now's your chance. I know this isn't the ideal format for a book club, me staring at the chat window while you talk at me, but I'm so glad you guys are here and supporting me. This book club is free. Anyone is welcome to join. It's private, but anyone can request to join. You just go to my Discord server and you go to the bot channel and you click the appropriate icon and you are admitted to the book club. You don't have to read the book to be in the book club. You could just listen if that's what you like to do. Um, my Discord server has 500 people on it and only about half of them are in the book club, but it's not a busy Discord server. It's, it's very chill. It's very slow. People talk about the book. People talk about vampires. We just hang out. And I'd love for you to join us if you're not already or just come to these streams. Um, I don't charge my Patreon patrons for this stream, though they fund my existence in general. So in a way this is supported by Patreon because if they stopped, I couldn't do this either, even though this is like a, a freebie for them and for everyone. So thank you. If you're part of my Patreon or part of my Discord, you are awesome. I'm so glad that you are here. Yes, Lista is the best vampire and you are the best audience because you agree with me. No, just kidding. Janet Jackson had a baby at 50. Yeah, women do it all the time. It's perfectly fine. You know, if you've got a good support system and health care and everything, you'll be okay. Uh, sadly, a lot of women do not have good health care or support systems, and it's hard for them, but it's not impossible. You know, Belle back in 1838 or whenever this came out, 1843, I'm sure it was very high risk. But she also had ghost powers, so maybe that's why she was okay. Or maybe she died in childbirth like everyone else.
if I ever talked vampires with Count Jacula, um, I've hung out with him a couple times, but I haven't talked to him in years. No, we haven't talked about vampires. We usually just talk about like what's going on in life and stuff. I haven't seen him in like six, seven years. Back when I used to go to cons and hang out with people. Nah, we lost touch. Sixty-seven was the oldest ever pregnancy. Huh. Unless you count like biblical ones, right? Because wasn't Sarah like two hundred fifty years old? Something I don't know. I'm not a Bible scholar. Sean Rook highly recommends joining the Patreon. Thank you, Sean. I highly recommend it too. There's three versions of Frank Wildhorn's Dracula musical on YouTube and none of them are English. Oh, I missed that. It was on Broadway when I was living in New York and I missed the Wildhorn Dracula because I was going through a phase where I didn't like things. Never seen the wild horde Dracula. Count Chocula cereal or Frankenberry? Well, first of all, Frankenberry is gross and Count Chocula has vampires. So Count Chocula is infinitely better than that gross pink stuff. I would like to see more adaptations of Lord Ruthven. I think he doesn't get adapted that much because the story has no dialogue in it. It's just like the story is basically a summary of a story instead of an actual story. So someone would have to like think about it and write their own dialogue. But you'd think someone would. Like that's ripe for the adaptation, but it doesn't happen often. Probably because it's not as romantic. It's tragic, but... You could write romance in it. Make Aubrey and Rutherin romantic. I want to see the gay adaptation of this, please. I'm probably the only one I know. You can find the English one on YouTube. Will you send it to me? You're in my Discord server. You send me that link. I want it. Almost out of cider. So, what are we reading next time? Before this book, I picked this book because it was I thought it would be light and humorous. Before this book, we had read a sort of denser, very serious gothic novel. Before that, we had read a YA teenage horny romance book. And before that... We had read urban fantasy. So I'm trying to like pick something a little bit different every time. And I was like, well, what do I want to pick this time? Because kind of come full circle. We've done a lot of the like classic vampire trope books. <coughs> Excuse me. One second. <coughs> <coughs> Choking on my cider. I better drink more cider. I'm so sorry. My chair is so squeaky. You know, you say please no Twilight, but I realize I should have suggested Midnight Sun because I have it now and it's the new hotness and everyone's talking about it and I'm missing that boat. I'm drinking cider instead of wine because I thought it would be more Christmassy, okay? It happens. Also, I'm afraid I'm allergic to wine and that makes me sad. So anyway, wanted to pick something wildly different this time. Something just like off the wall different. And I put up a few options of vote and by a landslide, like more than twice as many votes, more votes than any other book has ever gotten in the history of these polls that I do on my Discord, has won. Next book, Vampire Hunter D, which is a Japanese light novel, which has very little meaning to me because it looks just like a regular novel. I don't know what's light about it. It's just a book 
Um, I guess it's not like serious literature, but it's not short and it's not easy. It's a novel. Vampire Hunter D is the first in the Vampire Hunter D series. Um, it's a Japanese book, but it's been translated to English. So, you know, if you don't speak Japanese, get the English version. It is not a manga. It is not a graphic novel. It is a novel. And the Vampire Hunter D series has like 28 books in it, 42 books, something, 67 books in it. So we're just reading the first one. And there was a movie made out of it, an anime movie. Um, which was completely overshadowed by its sequel movie, Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, which is based on the third book in the series. So you can read this book, then the second, then the third. I don't have the second. I have this and the third. Apparently you don't need to read the second. It's okay. So a foreign book. I think this is the first non-English language book that we've chosen. The first book in translation we've chosen for book club. So that'll be interesting. Vampires from a different country different hemisphere unless you happen to live over there in which case thank you for being here because time zones this book came out is this for real oh whew, okay it, it showed the author's birth date and i thought that was the date the book came out why would it show his birthday so this book came out in 1983 it is 80s japanese vampire hotness it's lighting okay 1983, that is my birth year. This book is as old as I am. So we are going to go back in time, do some like classic Japanese literature for a light novel. Formative Japanese vampires. Are you excited? I am. This book is 268 pages. Uh, this edition is the first English translation edition and it wasn't translated into English for a very long time. If the blurb on the back is to be believed, people were clamoring for it in English for decades. This came out in 2005. They finally translated it to English and the people rejoiced because they only had the movie and they couldn't read the book if you don't know uh, Japanese. I took Japanese in high school. I took four years of Japanese and I've lost most of it. I can read it, but I can't speak it. But... Um, I'm not going to try reading in Japanese. I have my nice English version. That makes me happy. All right. So the novel that inspired the hit motion picture in English for the first time. It is the year 12,090 AD. The world has ended, ravaged in a firestorm of man's wars and madness. But from the wreckage, a few humans manage to survive. A few humans and something else. Doris Lang knew what her fate was when the vampire lord Count Magnus Lee bit her. An agonizing transformation into one of the undead, to be stalked by her fellow villagers or cursed to become the bride of the unholy creature and face an eternity of torment driven by thirst for human blood. There was only one chance, and as she watched him ride in from the distance, she knew there was hope. Salvation from a vampire hunter named D. I like that the protagonist is a lady. Love lady protagonists. Made into the international hit film Vampire Hunter D, this classic work by Japanese horror fiction master Hideyuki Kukuchi has been sought by English-speaking fans for decades. DH Press and Digital Manga Publishing are honored to make this translation of the first novel in the ongoing series of Vampire Hunter D books available for the first time. Featuring eight illustrations. Nice. Yes, my high school had a Japanese class. My high school only had Spanish and Japanese, but I grew up in Southern California where we had a very large Japanese population, so it made sense. And I didn't want to take Spanish because everyone took Spanish, and I had to be like indie and hipster and different from everyone else who was taking Spanish. These are the illustrations. Very retro. Oh, 12,090, not 1,290. No, this is 
millennia into the future, not the past. This is like, in a world that has been destroyed and built again, vampires. One, two, comma, zero, nine, zero AD. It's all gone. That's a good cider. Very sweet. If you like sugar, you'll like it. Tastes like donuts. So I hope you will join me this month going forward. You have until the 13th to read this book, and then we'll pick our next book. And I always do my live streams around the 13th. Um, this month, the 13th was on a weekend. I don't do streams on the weekends because nobody comes to streams on the weekend, and I want you to be here. I don't know why people don't come to streams on the weekends, but they don't. So I do it on Monday. So join my Discord. I'll let you know the exact date and time that the stream for this is happening. Otherwise, just read it. You can talk about it in the Discord as you read it. Um, you can post spoilers if you want. You can do whatever you want. Or you just wait and come here and talk to me about it. If you talked about it in the Discord with me or just at me, I read through everything. So your ideas might give me ideas. And then I'll have more things to talk about on here which I appreciate everyone who gave their thoughts on Christmas Carol because you came up with things that I didn't even come up with. You can post the Dracula musical link directly on the Discord so everyone can go watch it. I watched the Vampire Hunter D movies eight years ago. And I remember it was eight years ago because it was during Hurricane Sandy and New York City was entirely shut down. And I was home from work with nothing to do and I was very sick. I had a very bad cold. So I was thinking about what I wanted to do for my next Maven video because I'd been doing Maven for over a year by then. And I was trying to watch things that I didn't know about. So I sat down and watched those two movies while I had this horrible cold thinking, oh, I'll make this my next video because variety and talking about things that I'm not used to. And I remember watching them and being like, okay, I have no idea what to say about those. They, they sure were movies. And it wasn't that I didn't like them or that I didn't think much of them. I just wasn't inspired, I guess. So I, um, I let it go and I never did a content about it. Um, but I've always wanted to revisit them because I know they're very popular and people ask me about them all the time. And I'd like to share with people what they're interested in. So if reading this inspires something new, I might go back and watch those movies and then make like a regular vampire review about the movies with my knowledge of this book incorporated. Well, thank you, Adrian Work, for the super chat, $2. Am I going to post audio for eventual VTM game? Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Well, thank you, Music Cabaret, for $3. You're awesome. Everyone says Bloodlust is superior to the first. Um, I think they kind of build on each other. It can't exist without the other. I think a lot of people voted for Vampire Hunter D because they'd already read it. And of the other books that I recommended and suggested... You should watch the first one first and Bloodlust second. They were like, oh, here's a book I've already read. I want to vote that for book club because I don't have to read it again. Or I can revisit this thing I already know I like. People like familiarity. It is a much older book than the other books that I suggested. So I'm glad I'm going to read it. Um, one of my lovely followers sent me this copy of the book to my P.O. box. People send me books to my P.O. box all the time, which is awesome. I love having a P.O. box. I don't know why I didn't get one sooner, but um, my vampire library is growing so much. Um, they sent me this and the third one. So now I have them and I can read them and I hadn't gotten around to it yet because part of the whole reason I started the book club is motivation for helping me read the books in my vampire library that are piling up and I just need to read. And if you all read them with me, I will. And we will get through the entire library.
Bloodlust is better in terms of animation, but adaptation-wise, the first Vampire Hunter D movie was closer to the book than Bloodlust was. But you know the thing about adaptations is that they make things better. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, the book was better than the movie. The book's so much better than the movie. But adaptations can take a book that might not be as successful and, you know, fix things about it. So the, that the adaptation was more different from the book isn't necessarily a strike against it. I know the adaptation of Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust, the third book, is very popular and people love it. And I think it's a much more engaging movie and people just get into it more. I definitely need to rewatch them. Oh, you're sending me a comment? Thank you. I look forward to it. I go to my PO box on Tuesday, so I'm going to go tomorrow and see if there's anything in it. Every time I get like a stack of stuff from my PO box, I make showing you what I got and saying thank you because it's so great. Face off with Dom Smith about the value of adaptation that aren't loyal to the books. But Dom and I pretty much agree on everything. That's why we work so well together. My favorite work of Poe. Huh. For nostalgia reasons, I got to say The Pit and the Pendulum because that was a story that my mom used to read to me when I was a little girl. And it just it stuck with me and inspired me a lot and influenced a lot of my writing. But aesthetically, um, well, if we're talking all works, it's got to be the Raven, right? Poems. But, you know, story-wise, not poems. Um, aesthetically, the Master of the Red Death, because of the Family of the Opera connection, because the Family of the Opera cosplays as the Red Death, even though he dresses in red, which the Red Death in Poe dresses in black. Excuse me, the Phantom got it wrong. But, you know, it's also socially relevant right now the raven of course do you know how many like copies of the raven i have on my gothic shelf which is sitting right there like illustrated copies oh i gotta show you this Hey, I found my Wuthering Heights comic books. Classic. Okay. So Edgar Allan Poe, since you asked, got like these illustrated copies. They're just amazing. Um, what is this? Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven comic form. Do I have a bust of palace, you ask me? Do you see that bust of palace above my chamber door up there? You see it, right? Sitting right above my chamber door. You ask me if I have a bust of palace. Whose house do you think you're in? I also have a purple curtain. See the fluttering of each purple curtain. <laughs> do I have a bust of palace? Where was I? See, the fall of the House of Usher is nice because it has characters. <laughs> a lot of them don't really have like characters you can really get into, but Madeline and Roderick Usher are very cool people. So many volumes of Forgotten Lore. Here we go. The Raven, completely illustrated. Love this one. These are the original illustrations, you know, reprinted. My Edgar Allan, sorry, I hit the microphone. Edgar Allan Poe coloring book, which I have not colored in because I must like keep it pristine forever. Edgar Allan Poe coloring book. Oh, look at that. And then this one, which is my newest one, Raven pop-up book. There he is reading his book with his purple curtains and his bust of palace. Chamber door. Oh, 
flung wide the windows. Even nothing more. Even on the bus to palace. I guess that's Lenore in the palm of his hand. It's Lenore. Um, so my daughter, my little baby daughter is 18 months old. Her middle name is Lenore. Just in case you doubted my levels of fandom, her middle name is Lenore legally on her birth certificate. It's the house, the castle, the sea. Oh, you'd watch a read through of this book. Like if I just read you the Raven, I wish I had a better voice, like a good narrating spooky person voice and I could just read you stuff for your enjoyment. I bought this pop-up book at a tiny bookshop in Charleston, South Carolina, where I was visiting because it was the start of a ghost tour. Because when you go to Charleston, South Carolina, you go on ghost tours. I think I have a book. Yeah, here it is. So this was the book written by the person who invented the ghost tour, the ghost of Charleston, and then they take you around. So you go to this bookshop and you buy the book. The dude is there. He autographs the book for you. And then he's not the one who takes you on the tour. They have tour guides. They take you around Charleston, show you all the haunted places, some of the stories in the book. And then you like shop at the bookshelf because of course you do, or the books shop for your bookshelf. And that's where I bought this Raven pop-up book because of course I did. It's gorgeous. I have seen the Vincent Price adaptation of Mask of the Red Death and Vincent Price is perfect in everything he does. I don't know how we got onto Edgar Allan Poe. It's your fault. You started it. But yeah, I'm a bit of a fan, just like a bit. I don't think Geraldine and Christabel is a vampire. However, I do think she inspired vampires, notably um, Carmilla. But she also inspired Polly Dory with the vampire. But I don't think she is a vampire. I think she was just supposed to be like a fey creature of some kind. I don't think she was going to bite anyone's neck and suck anyone's blood. Yeah, see, if I was going to make like a 40-part video series of just reading Dracula, I could do that. But I don't want to just water down my channel that much. Try to keep some variety. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking of it. I know, Master of the Red Death does hit a little too close to home, but my favorite gothic sad boy dresses up as the Red Death. How can we not stand? What song do you think this plays? It plays Masquerade, thank goodness. Some of these music boxes play like the most odd song. Like you'll have the one of the mirror scene, which should be angel music or maybe even the Phantom of the Opera title song. And it's playing like all I ask of you, like why? Hello from Brazil. Hello to you too. Thank you for coming. Let's see what else I have. Just dismantling my entire bookshelf. So this is a teeny tiny copy of just all of Edgar Allan Poe. This is the Raven. Oh, did you hear it? It talks, so. And then the poem here. Hello from Germany. Oh, thank you for coming. I know it's very late for you. What do I like to read when I'm not reading vampire slash gothic slash Bronte? Um, I like, uh, not gothic. Like this entire shelf is gothic. This entire shelf is nonfiction that's vaguely connected to gothic things. 
Um, this shelf is fantasy and sci-fi that's not gothic, though it usually has darker themes. I do like all kinds of fantasy and sci-fi. Have I read all the Vampire Chronicles books by Anne Rice? Yes, I have. All 15. Stop. My little thing's making bills. Um, that one, that bookshelf there is contemporary, like Oprah's book club type books, like The Secret Life of Bees and Schindler's List and like those kind of contemporary books um, and other things. And then also all of my plays and opera librettos. And that book over there is classics. I love classics, you know, all those 1000 books you should read before you die classics. That bookshelf in the corner over there is, not that one, that one is all YA. It's very large. It's mostly YA sci-fi and fantasy. You can't really see it. Um, but there is one shelf for contemporary. I do like contemporary YA sometimes, especially if it deals with queer themes. Love re reading about queer teenagers and love, you know, growing up and discovering themselves. And that one that you see in the corner, like way back there, that's more like coffee table books and like fun books, books about books, crafting books. I just heard my robot vacuum cleaner wake up. She vacuums at 10 o'clock. That must mean it's 10 o'clock. I'm going to go turn her off, but we aren't going to stay here much longer. So don't go anywhere. Oh, she turned off by herself. I was texting Paul and I'm like, turn her off. So our robot vacuum cleaner, um, Paul named her cumin because she does the vacuuming. And also we like spices. And, you know, he's a dad now, so he has to make dad jokes. But um, she can speak all kinds of different languages. You can change the language on her. But he didn't like the voice that was English. So he picked one of the Chinese voices. And she has like six different Chinese voices because it's a Chinese robot. So she just speaks to us in this very cute, adorable little Chinese voice. And her name is cumin. That's our robot vacuum cleaner. What does it say on my shirt? Oh, you missed it earlier. It says, good evening. And I made it myself today. Um, second version of the shirt I made, I made another one where the spider web was white instead of this gray color and it made it much harder to see. It's still kind of hard to see just because my font is so extra, but it's a work in progress. I'd love to make merch like shirts that you could buy. Not that I make with my own hands, but Want to see what else I made? I have to show you, since you're still here humoring me, lovely people that you are. Okay, if you're on my Discord, you've already seen this, but I made this little bat. So reflective. You can see she's like dimensional and like a doily. Oh, so many reflections. There we go. Can you see my bat? I made it with my own hands. Framed it. She's going to go in my library. And then I made this. It's a lovely Grim Reaper shadow box. This was one of the first things I made, so it's not as good. I was still practicing, still learning. But I like the colors. The blue matches my other Grim Reaper art that's up there that I won at an auction at an art show. Well, that's so sexy. Yeah, it's paper cutouts. It's just layers of paper that are separated by foam squares. So it's like, gives it this dimensional look. You can sort of see it's like three dimensional. Love the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper is my favorite. Thank you. I had fun making them. If I'm like, get good at this making thing things, I might start an Etsy store and like sell things, but you'll see. I don't know if anybody would actually want to buy these things I make, but I like the art. It's fun to make art. I'm like crafting and stuff, doing things with my hands. I should write a book about the Grim Reaper. I should write three of them. 
at least two more of them. That'd be great. You know I already did that, right? You're joking, right? <sighs> we have been here about an hour and a half. Do you have any other thoughts about our book that we read or book that we're going to read or Edgar Allan Poe or Lestat or The Grim Reaper or anything else? Now's your chance. Dracula read through on a second channel. Maybe. But then would anyone watch it? I mean, people barely watch this stuff on my main channel. I have about 40,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, which is wonderful. Great. Thank you so much. Yet my videos get 3,000 hits. So the algorithm is suppressing me. It's not letting my subscribers know that I make videos or the videos I'm making don't interest my subscribers, yet they stay subscribed to me for some reason. So even my most popular videos don't get 40,000 hits. I always never get as many hits as I have subscribers and I don't want to do anything to make my YouTube channel suffer more or make the algorithm suppress me more just because I feel like YouTube's very much out to get the little guys like me. Can I hold my art up again? My art. I did not design this art. Um, I found a pattern online and then I modified it. So, um, but it was like a free pattern. I didn't steal the art or anything. It was an open source. I don't know how people use YouTube. I don't know things. And this bat was like just a pattern that existed that anyone can make and it's free. Oh, it's so reflecty. I'm sorry. There we go. Take a better picture of it and better lighting. All about my tags. Well, I got a lesson on how to properly tag my videos, supposedly. So I am tagging them the best possible way I can. <sighs> who knows? Maybe, maybe, who knows? I, I know my scripted videos that are reviews of things get the most views. Those are the hardest to make and take the longest time. And they're very impossible to make right now because, um, with the pandemic, schools are closed and I am all day maintaining a very rambunctious six-year-old who has ADHD and needs a lot of attention and I cannot sit and write. So I can make videos like this where I don't have to think the brain words and I can just be off the cuff or do the reading things like I've been doing, but sitting and writing has just proved impossible. So that's why I haven't been making those videos. And I think my channel suffered for it. I haven't lost subscribers. I'm still gaining subscribers, which is wonderful but I'm not getting the hits on my videos. People aren't actually watching my videos. They're just subscribing and not watching. I don't really make any money from YouTube, so it doesn't make that big of a difference. Um, like hit wise, finance wise, it's it's nothing. Like if, if it wasn't for Patreon, I wouldn't be able to do it. So as long as my Patreon stays the same way it is, we're good. I'll keep making as many videos as I can for you. And I hope you enjoy them, the people who actually do watch them. The next game I am doing, since you ask, is um, Vampire the Masquerade Coteries of New York because a Patreon patron has requested it and I've put it off for a long time because of the pandemic and everything and I am getting to it. So I'm actually going to do a, I'll either do a pre-recorded edited video and post it to my Patreon and then make it public or I'll do a live stream one way or the other. We'll see how it goes. Or maybe I'll, if it's a long enough game, I'll do one and then the second the other way. So you'll be able to enjoy that with me. And then based on my experiences playing it, I'll do a scripted review video. We'll see how it goes. That's definitely the next thing I'm tackling. Thank you for watching everything I put out. I know those of you that are here right now, watch me and you guys are awesome. Like of the 40,000 people who have subscribed to me, you're the ones who actually watch. Pandemic killed a lot of planning. Very true. Oh, I'm happy I opened your eyes to vampire media. Someone has to do it, and that's why I'm here. Oh. 
Well, thank you all so much for coming, for subscribing, for watching. I hope you will join me to read Vampire Hunter D by Hideyuki Kikuchi. This month, you have a whole month to read it. It is 268 pages long, not very long. Japanese light novel. It's a light reading, right? Discuss it with me in the Discord or amongst yourselves. And then join us again for another stream around the 13th, never before the 13th, but either on the 13th or shortly thereafter. And we'll have another talk. If you want to talk to me more about Lestat, come into my Discord. I have a um, Anne Rice sub channel that's secret and private. So you have to tell me that you're like a super hardcore Anne Rice fan if you want to get let into that channel because it's only for like the super nerds like me. Um, if you just want to talk about Anne Rice like vaguely, you can do that in any channel books probably. You read Pandora, that does count. Pandora is a delight of a book. It's a very small, tiny, little half book, but still fun. She's a delight. Absolutely counts. It's the shortest of all the books. So if you're gonna start with something, like to dip your toe in, read Pandora. Yes. All right, thank you for coming. Thank you for humoring me about the shirt I made and for talking about a vampire Christmas carol, Charles Dickens and everything with me. Can I explain what Discord is before I leave? Yes, Discord is like chat rooms. It's just like a chat service. Um, if you go to the description of this video, you see a link. It will have you download an app or open it in a browser. You don't have to download the app if you don't want to. And you just join some chat rooms. And there's different chat rooms for all the different things about vampires. We, you can talk about movies, books, games, art, vampire stuff. We even have a sub channel for Phantom of the Opera because we roll that way. Just click the link and we'll talk you through it. It's very easy. If you gave me a hundred dollars, would I stay for you? Stay here talking to you? But what would we talk about? I feel like we've run out of conversation. Thank you for leaving those musical links, Vampire Hunter D lover. Track of the musical, yes, I want to watch it. <laughs> Just come to my Discord and talk to me there, yes. Um, mention your is supreme, extra, extreme love of Anne Rice in any channel, and I will see it. Um, maybe general or maybe books. I will see it. I always see it. Oh, good, Victoria. You're my kind of people. All right. Thank you for coming. I will see you very soon in my next video, which will be, oh, I got something very cool. Someone reached out to me and she's like, I do vampire subscription boxes. If I sent you one, would you make a video about it? And I said, heck yeah, send me that vampire subscription box. I will make that video. That is going to be my next video, probably very soon. And then we're going to do Coteries of New York. And then who knows what else for my third video this month? Because we always try to do three for Patreon because otherwise we'd go belly up. But thank you for coming to this live stream for the book club. Read Vampire Hunter D with me or don't and just come and listen to me talk about it. I love you. Good night. I'm going to click this red button now.